If their desire is for Kenya to pull out of Somalia, my friends, all they need to do is what they should have done 20 years ago, which is put their house in order and Kenya will come back to Kenya. Talking tough, President Huru's answer to Al Shabaab's ultimatum. Islam is not terrorism, and neither is terrorism Islam. Islam simply means peace. Emotional prayers and heartfelt messages for victims of the Westgate attack. Plus, man reunited his family after 71 years. And a hero's welcome for Kenya's Berlin record breakers. This is KTN Prime with Linda Ogutu and Ben Katili. Today is the first day of September 2013. A very good evening from the Standard Group Center here in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. And many thanks for joining us on the program. Many thanks for joining us now. The sting of the attack on the Westgate shopping mall made for yet another tough speech by President Uhuru Kenyatta, the content of which leaders of the Somali-based militia will not want to hear. Kenya will not leave Somalia. That is, of course, at least not until it is ensured that groups like the Al-Shabaab no longer call Somalia their home. That is the president talking tough. We are working on that story by John Alan We shall be bringing it to you later on in this live newscast. All right, we shall not be cowed. These were President Uhuru Kenyatta's words in the face of the Westgate attack. The president has announced that the formation of a commission of inquiry into the attack that led to the death of 67 people and maintains that Kenya will stand its ground in Somalia even as it wages a war against terror at home. Well, Kisanyabu attended the prayers and now reports. One by one, religious leaders stepped forward to pray for the country in the wake of the Westgate attack. They prayed for the victims of the attack on the Westgate shopping mall. They prayed for the children left behind by parents who perished in the attack. And they prayed for peace and prosperity in Kenya. We wish to continue to urge all Kenyans to continue to live as brothers and sisters, no matter their faith, their color, their creed, their race, or ethnic background. Leaders would refute claims attributed to the terrorists who are alleged to have identified themselves as Muslims on a mission. These are sadists, people who enjoy killing. Hasidi, Hasidi Hamna Sababu. You kill for no cause. Because Islam doesn't spell that. Christianity doesn't say so. That is terrorism. The first three sessions of the interreligious service were dedicated to prayers. In the fourth session, leaders from across the country took to the podium. We must prescribe higher punishment for border and security officers who for a fee turn a blind eye and allow our enemies to enter our country to hurt us. And in the face of reports that the attack was precipitated by Kenya's incursion into Somalia, President Uhuru Kenyatta presented a defiant message. We will stay there until they bring order in their nation. We will also be putting in place a commission of inquiry to establish if we could have done things better going forward. In a show of solidarity, leaders now uniting under the slogan, We are one. Kenyatta 
Leaders from across the country coming together to condemn the attacks on the Westgate shopping mall, saying that the perpetrators cannot hide behind religious reasons. This, even as a forensic probe that is expected to shed light, continues. Wilkinson Abu KTN in Nairobi. Let's stay with Westgate and KTN has learned that charred remains of what health officials say are numerous body parts have been moved to the city mortuary. The officials say the remains of more of the Westgate attack victims are scheduled for DNA profiling. KTN's Dennis Onsarigo now reports on the latest body retrieval that includes bodies of security agents. The government has placed the number of those killed during the Westgate Mall attack at 67. But details emerging from the mall indicate that maybe there could have been more than 67 people killed. Bodies recovered from the rubble that was once three floors up of the ultra-modern shopping complex have been moved to the city mortuary. A senior health official has told KTN that remains from the mall mainly limbs of about seven or eight victims were moved to the city mortuary as government pathologists sought to match the DNA of the remains. Among the body parts are those of a man in police boots and his rifle. So far, six security agents have been confirmed killed. The charred remains were ferried to the city mortuary as it emerged. It might take several days to establish the number of those killed in the mall siege that lasted a straight four days. Health officials who spoke to Katie and say it has taken a week to have the limbs of the victim of the Westgate Mall attack moved from the scene of the deadly attack, with some saying the government has not been keen on clearing sections of the mall. Of concern is a corner in the complex mall where a strong stench has been originating from, raising serious fears that there could be more bodies still trapped under the rubble. Some sections of the mall are waterlogged and with the fire that gutted down the premises, there are now fears that evidence to be obtained could have been destroyed by now. Katie has learned that foreign forensic teams have expressed concerns about the manner in which some of the victims of the attacks were allowed to bury their loved ones way before investigations into the attacks had commenced. The experts had wanted to carry out comprehensive tests on the remains, among them extracting bullet heads from the bodies of those slain in the attack. The government has been economical with the exact number of hostages or victims caught up in the Saturday mall attack with the Interior Ministry blowing hot and cold. It will take several days to establish the identities of the limbs of the Westgate mall attack victims as the government embarks on yet another commission of inquiry following a matter that touches on the country's national security. Denzo Sarigo, KTN Prime. Now the sting of the attack on the Westgate shopping mall made for yet another tough speech by President Uhuru Kenyatta, the content of which leaders of Somalia-based militia will not want to hear. Now, Kenya will not leave Somalia, at least not until it is ensured that groups like the Al-Shabaab no longer call Somalia their home. President Kenyatta's assertion cements Kenya's commitment to the war effort in Somalia. But how long Kenyan forces will remain in Somalia depends on a lot more than a commitment from President Kenyatta. Here's Ketian's John Alanamu with the hard facts. If the Al-Shabaab were praying that Kenya's forces would leave Somalia... And I want to be categorically clear, we will stay there until they bring order in their nation. President Kenyatta's words come eight days after the Westgate attack. And two weeks shy of the two-year anniversary since Kenya's defense forces crossed into Somalia. October the 16th, 2011. A lot has happened before and since then. Mogadishu, once a stage of an inch-by-inch inch war between Amazon forces and the Al-Shabaab, is a far different place. On August the 6th, 2011, the Al-Shabaab pulled out of Mogadishu, what the group called a strategic retreat. Somali President Hassan Sheikh Mohamud has now spent a full year as president, having been elected on September the 10th, 2012. And in the fight to choke the Al-Shabaab's resources, it has been 369 days since Kenya's defense forces took control of Al-Shabaab's cash cow. 
port city of Kismayo. After we have taken all their uh, areas of uh, where they have been relying on to get their revenue, you find there's only a rift in between. The irony of the Westgate attack, analysts have said, is that it shows just how weakened the Al Shabaab are inside Somalia. They can hit at those capitals in order to discourage the soldiers in the field. We will not be cowed. So, President if Kenyatta's assertions are based on gains actually made on the ground. But that is one side of the story. Majority came to Barawa. In fact, here's the other, as explained by Kenya's senior most officer in Amisom, Deputy Force Commander Major General Simon Karanja. And Hagdere, although it's not a port town, but there are some small towns which they use as a port. So these are the three areas, and these are the key areas that we would like to capture. Yeah. These are the three areas. But of course, I think the force commander did mention that we are unable to expand beyond where we are because of troop numbers. The current number of Amazon troops on the ground in Somalia is 17,709, including police. Kenya has contributed 4,562 troops to Amazon forces. For Amazon to completely overrun the Al Shabaab, it would need at least 6,000 more boots on the ground. A 2010 estimate posted on the Amazon website states that a full year's military operation would require 817.5 million US dollars. An expansion of troop numbers would almost certainly push Amazon's budget beyond the $1 billion per year mark. Another hurdle is Kenyan forces' acceptability on the ground. The proverbial elephant in the room amongst the Somali public and to an extent, troops from contributing forces. At the beginning of August this year, heads of states from countries contributing troops held a status conference in Kampala, Uganda, one that military sources told us was primarily because of the Somali government's discomfort with Kenya's alleged support for Ahmed Madobe, the leader of the Raskamboni Brigade. So, President Kenyatta may have every intention of seeing the Al-Shabaab decimated in Somalia, but in translating those intentions to action, he will have to hope that money for troop expansion comes and confidence in Kenya's troops on the ground is bolstered. John Alanamu, KTN. All right, John Alanamu there reporting. It is from his story that we derive our big question tonight. We're asking you, should Kenyan troops remain in Somalia? Well, tell us what you think. SMS your yes or no response, followed by a short comment to the number 22155. And of course, you can tweet us at Linda Ogutu at Ben underscore Kitili and at KTN. Kenya shall be sampling some of those comments during this live newscast. Right. The identity of the terrorists behind the Westgate attack remains a mystery. Speculation abounds over how many the gunmen really were and whether or not there was a woman among them. KTN's Ashamwilu reports. Hazy images of four men allegedly captured by CCTV footage from the Westgate Mall. The closest Kenyans have come to the terrorists behind the four-day siege. Hazy being the key word. Other pieces of the puzzle have come from witness accounts, accounts that were quickly discredited by government officials. But Gladys Wanjao says she knows what she saw. I saw two. They had bullets crisscrossed and then heavy, heavy gun. That's when I was running back to the shop. I saw two women, but later on, the police say that they were just people dressed like women to confuse gender. We do not want to delve into the gender issue for now. There are, there are, there are no women, actually. It is very clear that it's only men. Some men had dressed like uh, women to mislead the situation, but all the terrorists are male. They were just wearing trousers and a top. Yeah, they didn't have hijab or anything, no. So I was just asking my colleagues, because we all, we saw them, were like, okay, what really went down there? As questions abound over the militant's gender, there is an even more important question of exactly how many the gunmen were and whether or not they did escape. The way terrorists operate is that uh, there are those who are ready to die, but there's a team that might wish to survive to plan for another one or to go and report verbatim what took place. So the likelihood is that there's a, 
a number that could have walked out with the people as they were being ushered out in the initial stages of the attack. Na huyu jama alitoka na sisi sio msomali ni mwarabu. A theory has also emerged that some of the gunmen may have escaped through an underground tunnel at the west gate. We are not ruling out the tunnel. Of course the gunmen must stand up and say uh, it, it was never used. But the fact that we don't know where the nine are, the fact that we have not even been shown the bodies of the five, uh, makes somebody wonder how, how or what happened. It's time the government tells us the truth. We don't mind knowing the truth. In fact, even if they said, we failed here because you we were not ready, that's what we want to know as Kenyans. Government's refusal to allow foreign forensic experts to collect DNA samples has also been viewed as a cover-up attempt. As we stand now, I think it is up to the government to prove to Kenyans that yes, we killed five and uh, the other five, we don't know where they are. I mean, they are the nine, so to speak. What happened to the people who attacked us? Because I don't know which group is that. Is it Al-Qaeda? Is it Al-Shabaab? What happened to them? Six days after the government started investigations into the mall attack, all that Kenyans have heard are contradictory statements, inconclusive reports, and no word on who or where the people responsible are. Ashamwilu, KTN, Nairobi. So I'll continue to cover each and every small detail of this story for you in the aftermath of the Westgate attack. Let's now switch gears and there was drama after a suspected armed robber was gunned down along Jogo Road this morning. Members of the public keenly followed the dramatic chase as police officers climbed onto the roof of an apartment to capture the said suspect. Kitchens Edith Kimani with the details. Mid-morning at Eastern Apartments on Jogo Road and the scene is akin to a movie. Outside, members of the public shouting directions to police officers who are looking for a suspected armed robber hiding in the attic. The spectacle began early morning when the suspect was reported to be stealing from motorists along Jogo Road. Police say he was brandishing his gun to scare his victims. But his reign ended as soon as police got wind of his alleged activities, chasing him to this apartment belonging to his mother. More policemen joined the hunt. And then... More gunshots. The suspect is shot twice as he attempts to escape. Firemen who are asked to get the body from the roof have a difficult time moving it as a curious crowd tries to catch even a glimpse of the drama's protagonist. <laughs> Later, police officers proudly show off the gun the suspect was allegedly carrying, never mind the poor handling of the evidence. On the sidelines, a smaller story unfolds after this man raises tempers by allegedly saying something offensive to police officers. <laughs> the officers are not scared to point their guns at him, but the crowd hardly notices as slowly people disperse in smaller groups, each giving their account of the morning shootout. Edith Kimani. KTN Prime. Dramatic scenes there, I must say. Now, the former chief executive officer of the National Hospital Insurance Fund, Richard Kirich, was arrested over an alleged 4 billion shilling fraud. Kirich recorded a statement at the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. The former NHIF boss was arrested along with five others. They are expected to appear in court tomorrow. The 4 billion shilling NHIF scam is alleged to have involved shady dealings where ghost health facilities were awarded millions of shillings for non-existent medical services. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. But exactly what has happened? Let me just see. What has happened? No, no, there is nothing. It is just the process of uh, 
I was coming to take some sediment, mm -hmm. and that is it. You have, of course, you have all known what has been happening, and therefore it is a process towards getting to know what actually transpired during what we are doing as uh, civil servant schemes. So I can say there is really, there is no much which I can say for now, mm -hmm. but uh, it's just a process towards getting to know and maybe even the public should also be told that uh, I've come here, I've taken uh, a statement, and I'm now going. Thank you so much. Eh? God bless you. Well, many thanks for staying with us on KTN Prime on this first day of October. I've been uh, correct. It's not September 2013. And on the big question tonight, we're asking you, should Kenyan troops remain in Somalia? Let's see what some of you are saying on Twitter. George Otoma says, it would be cowardly for KDF to withdraw. They should complete their mission so that refugees can go back to their country. Jacob Bogo says on Twitter, Kenyan troops should remain in Somalia, but change tack. The war is no longer conventional. But keep All those right. SMSs coming. We're taking a short break. Stay with us. Watching Katie and Prime, and just ahead, a man reunited with his family 71 years after he left home in search of a job. Come on, we Tunaweza tunasema hapana ama tunasema ndio. Kama angetuambia tungeweza kununua kwa sababu sisi wote wase na fitana na wamama wako na makuru. Na wako na pesa wameweka kwa wakaun. Sasa wangekutana na wanunua hata shamba moja. You're watching KTN Prime. Watching Katie and Prime, thank you for staying with us. In other news making headlines, Deputy President William Ruto returns to The Hague tonight for the continuation of his trial at the International Criminal Court that resumes tomorrow. Elsewhere, the Standard Media Group and the Kenya Reuniko Fiti campaigns rolls out in different parts of the country. Details of these and much more coming up next. Deputy President William Ruto is leaving the country tonight for The Hague to attend to hearing of his case at the International Criminal Court. The court had adjourned after Ruto, through his lawyers, requested for time to attend to national issues following the waste kit attack. The hearing continues tomorrow. The judiciary has finalized the hearing of 187 election petitions out of a total of 188 which were filed after the general election. There is only one more pending election petition. More than 90 judges had petitions against governors, senators, members of the National Assembly, county women representatives, and county assembly speakers. Still in court, the chief executive officer of the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission, James Oswago, maintains that investigations against him are politically motivated. Oswago is being investigated over the 1.3 billion shilling BVR kit tender. Oswago now wants the director of the Public Prosecutions, Kiriako Tobiko, and the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission to drop the search warrants and investigations against him. Finally, the second caravan of the Nico Fiti campaign was flagged off today to distribute assistive devices to persons with disability. The campaign is sponsored jointly by Kenya Reinsurance Corporation, the Standard Media Group, and the Associations of Persons with Disability. Addressing the public during the flag of ceremony, Kenya Re Managing Director Jadia Morania said the initiative aims to empower the less privileged in all counties. My presence here is simply to underscore the importance of the work that is being done by a partnership headed by Kenya Re and supported by Standard Group in offering assistive devices for our people living with the disabilities. Ian Wafula, KTN. Let's not take you to a story that will definitely leave a good taste in your mouth. Now, an 83-year-old man who separated with his family members over 60 years ago reunited with the family in his home in Suboki, Anakuru County. The man separated with his family when he was just 10 years old. But a phone call to his elder brother from a stranger eventually turned out to be a good fortune to the family. Take a look. Hey! 
Laughter and songs of praise fill the compound of Juma Omolo Swangi, who separated with his family at the tender age of 10. Swangi was born in Koru village, Siaya district, and separated with his family during the state of emergency. <laughs> He began working for Asians and white settlers in the country. The old man traveled with the white settlers to Uganda without informing any of his family members. He later found his way back to Kenya and settled in Nakuru County. Wakati emergency, anakuta mimi, mimi toto kiasi. Na andiko na hii wa waindi ya gali ya mwosu. Kasi ya ku... Kutumwa tu, mimi nandiko kasi ya tutujukoni. Tutujukoni hiyo mimi nafanya, ndiyo niliingia kasi ya au suboi sasa. Ndiyo nilirudi, naingia kasi ya kupika kasi ya umpisi. The family of the old man tried to trace their lost one, but all in vain. They thought that the cruel hand of death had taken him. Eh, hey, nafurai. But a phone call later reunited the man with his family when his elder brother John Akula recently received a call from a stranger who said he had found his lost brother in Nakuru. Consequently, arrangements for traveling to Nakuru County to reunite with their kin began and luckily they found him alive and happy. He actually looks like his brother. So. Are you a Man U fan or is it Liverpool? And when you sit down to catch your favorite team's action on the football pitch, have you ever wondered what goes on behind the scenes? Well, Betty Charlo will tell you just how it becomes possible to bring you that lively football match on your screens. That's our subject tonight on how things work. Football. A game that attracts millions. Like a drug, many are hooked on it. The passion, the players, the coach, the fans. There's never a dull moment. Well, unless things go south. 90 minutes of high adrenaline, most of the times a high octane affair. It's a moment to remember! It is the most popular sport with the most global television audience. So popular is the sport that it's played by close to 250 million players around the world. Tonight on How Things Work. In five seconds, four, three, two, one, and roll, friend. We take you behind the scenes and reveal another team that makes it possible for you to view your favorite matches and football teams from wherever and whenever. This is how things work. Sunday, the 15th of September, a game between perennial football rivals Gor Mahia and Tasca FC is in the offing. Kick of time, 3 p.m. This is the first time that the match is aired in high definition, which means it is a big deal. Let's go. We couldn't have shot how things work at any better time. It's 9 a.m., six hours before the match begins. The crew is on site, bundles of cables here and there. On the pitch, the stadium staff fix the essentials, goal posts, pitch advertising boards, and so on. Everything has to be in place. On the pitch, another important team is setting up. Camera operators take position and set up their cameras. A process that could take up to three hours. On a game like this one, Tasca Gomaya versus Tasca, we are doing 12 camera shoots. Basically, we're both shooting the same thing. 
but in different ways. The guys who are shooting it on a wide, the guys are shooting it on a closer. The guys waiting for the crowd reactions and stuff like this. So each camera has to tell a story on its own part. The camera operators are usually positioned at different parts of the pitch, with each camera focusing on a specific role and specific shots, like the offsides, the goalposts, the ball, the active player, the fans, and so forth. When the cameras are set, the camera control unit tests the cameras to ensure that their color temperatures are uniform. After all is set, the director who sometimes doubles up as a producer arrives three hours to kick off to do what they call a facility check. One thing we check is the cameraman, are they getting the cue light? And that's where you see the point, you, you see the tally light goes on, so that's, that's a cue light. The Q light goes because it's very important they have the Q light because for them to know they are live, the Q light, the tally light has to come on. So if it's not coming on, the cameraman is confused is, is he or she live? Uh, the second thing we check is obstacles. So we look for barriers, anything in front of the camera. So we remove them. So also we make sure that the, the sponsor branding is not in front of the camera, and that everything is in same sync so that when the camera pans, it doesn't eat an obstacle, everything is clean. After the facility check, it's just about two hours to the match. The whole crew meets for a brief where different aspects of the game are discussed. Tell you what, as we go, what you need to put together. By now, the fans begin entering the stadium. That's when things get even more exciting. With about one hour to the show, the whole crew takes position. Camera operators, the director, presenter, commentators, graphic designers, producers, just to name a few, go through a rehearsal. What happens is I got like nine cameras to cut to, but my sequence is one, two, three. One, two, three is my camera one, camera two, camera three. Camera one is what the viewer sees. He sees a white shot. Camera two is head to toe. A bit tighter, but head to toe. Camera three, it's a reaction camera. So camera three gives me most of the reaction, the pains, players screaming, keepers reacting, coaches shouting at the players. So there's that sequence you've realized to learn. I'm the one who, who gives you the goal, who logs the goal when it happens. I'm the one who keeps the clock. Every time there's a goal called, I give you, I give you that start. Every time there's a yellow card that is given or whatever start or whatever detail that is there, I'm the one who brings it into wordings. Just like a studio gallery, the minutes before the live game begins is full of pressure to perform, but especially to have a smooth start to the game without any glitches. On the pitch, the players go through a warm-up session. With a few minutes to kick off, the game begins. Three, two, one, and cue Karo. Graphic in. Clear the graphic in five seconds. Clear and graphic in for weather. And for the next 90 minutes, the whole crew works together to ensure no moment goes unnoticed. With the match underway, the commentators and analysts view the game from a vantage point, which makes it easier for them to keep abreast with what's happening in the field. It's going to be a free kick, but a little pressure on that side. It's all part of the game. So guys, guys know how we close them. Our clothes are shouting. And that is what goes on behind the scenes to bring you the live games. Betty Kialo, how things work. Interesting. So before you complain about that replay, you didn't see, you know, what happens behind the scene. Thanks, Betty, for that. Let's now switch gears to matters business to take a look at what's happening in the world of business. And Bonnie Tunia is standing by in the business studio with the latest. Bonnie, I understand the Kenyan economy has been expanding. Right, Ben. Yesterday we had very bad figures of inflation. Today we have positive numbers. Our economy is expanded by just about 4.3%, but details coming up shortly. Kenya's economy expands by 4.3% in the second quarter of 2013. Growth was held back by a major contraction in the tourism sector that continues to suffer from a decline in the visitor arrival numbers. Michael Karanja tells us why. During the second quarter, growth was largely driven by strong performance in the agricultural, manufacturing, power and financial services sectors. Low inflation and a stable shilling also characterize Q2. 
The construction sector recorded a significant growth of 6.7% compared to 1.1% growth over the second quarter of 2012 on the back of strong cement production to fuel the construction boom. The manufacturing sector grew by 4.3% with production moving away from food items to vehicle tires, soap and cement. Agriculture expanded by 5% while electricity and water grew by 12%. Activity at the Nairobi Securities Exchange continued to increase in the second quarter of 2013, the result being an average 20 share index of 4,790 points, compared to an average of 4,599 points in the first quarter. It was, however, the tourism sector that experienced the worst performance. The sector took a beating with booking cancellations, leading it to contract by 11.4%. With inflation jumping from 6.7% in August to 8.3% in September, this is likely to throw a spanner in the works, slowing down economic growth further in the next half of the year. The effect of this reduced economic activity is bound to affect the tax collection, which will impact further on government efforts to raise the revenue needed to finance the 1.6 trillion shilling budget. Michael Karanja, KTN Business Today. African economies and countries need to put measures in place to protect their citizens from the dangers of aflatoxin that has become common in the grains consumed in the continent. Speaking during the 5th African Grain Trade Summit, the Deputy Secretary General of East African Community, Jessica Irio, said that this influx of toxic food has increased prevalence of cancer and hepatitis B, in addition making people more susceptible to HIV AIDS, and called on leaders to deal with the issue decisively. A number of people have died uh, from ingestion of aflatoxin, contaminated food, either instantly uh, or slowly through cancers of the liver, hepatitis A and B, immune suppressions, hence HIV and AIDS uh, prevalences uh, on, the, on the increase in the region, stunted growth and so forth. We need to wake up and deal with the issue head on. Let's go to Western Kenya where leaders from that particular uh, sugar belt have asked the government to petition the common market for Eastern and Southern African against dumping of sugar in the local market. Now speaking to journalists, the officials led by Kakamega Senator Boni Halwale claimed that Egypt was exporting sugar it had imported from Brazil to the Kenyan market. This they claimed was unfair to local millers currently faced with higher production costs. Countries like Egypt do not grow any serious sugar again. However, Egypt imports sugar from Mauritius and Brazil. They repackage it and say, made in Brazil, then they export into the commercial market. So Kenya should go and be strong in commercial to demand that the only countries that can export sugar into commercial should be those countries that are known to produce sugar locally. Power interruptions are set to reduce by half only if Kenya Power plans to expand its overhead and underground cable around the central business district and are completed successfully. Now this and more coming up in the corporate briefs. Kenya Power Limited is to construct three new power lines at a cost of 273 million Kenya shillings in a bid to provide reliable power supply in Nairobi's central business district. Kenya Power says this will reduce by half power interruptions to businesses and commercial operations. The extension and construction of new cables will be laid both overhead and underground. Airtel Kenya has partnered with Pan Africa Life Insurance Limited and Micro Insure to launch Bimam Kononi, a life insurance product that will enable Airtel Money customers access affordable insurance via the mobile phones. With insurance penetration at below 3% in Kenya, Pan Africa Life hopes to tap into the market with premiums ranging from 15 Kenya shillings per week for a cover of up to 25,000 Kenya shillings. Huawei has unveiled its new Asen P6 smartphone into the Kenyan market as the firm seeks a greater foothold. The phone, touted as being among the slimmest smartphones in the world, is only 6.18 millimeters wide with a 4.7-inch screen. The mobile phone manufacturer expects to grow its customer base in Kenya with the latest phone entrant retailing across the country. 
The U.S. government has begun a partial shutdown of the government operations as a move that will see about 800,000 federal workers go for an unpaid forced leave after the Congress fails to agree on the country's budget. The three-week shutdown could cost the American government about 0.9% of its GDP in this quarter. The American government ground to a halt exactly 12 a.m. Eastern Time after its lawmakers in the House of Representatives and the Senate failed to agree on a spending bill to fund the government. On Monday, the Democratic-led Senate twice rejected an ultimatum from the House of Republicans that would only have funded the government if only funding for President Obama's health care law was delayed for at least a year. With both sides of the divide not relenting, the government shut down rendering about 800,000 federal employees followed with no guarantee of back payment once the deadlock is over. The idea of putting the American people's hard-earned progress at risk is the height of irresponsibility. And it doesn't have to happen. Among those heavily affected include NASA that has lost about 97% of its workforce, Environmental Protection Agency, Commerce, Labor and Interior and Treasury are some of the worst hit. A move that will see parks and museums close as well as a delay in pension and veterans benefits checks. The only exception being the uniformed forces. The U.S. government has not undergone a shutdown in 17 years with the last one lasting 21 days. From America, let's come back home and see how the numbers look like in the financial market review that is coming up next. KTN Business, in, in association with Guinness. He believes a man's name finds its meaning not in what he says, but in what he does. A name that is made of more. Let's now take a look at what's happening in the world of sports. Let's start with Martyrs Athletics and newly crowned World Marathon record holder Wilson Kipsang says he could still lower the world record he set in Berlin on Sunday. Kipsang arrived in the country alongside the women's winner Florence Kiplagat and the other Kenyan participants. Hassan Juma reports. Early morning at the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport and family members and friends huddled together. Craning for the man who managed to lower Patrick Macau's marathon mark in Berlin on Sunday by 15 seconds. An elected Wilson Kipsang exchanged pleasantries with Kenyans. <laughs> Florence Kiplagat and Elliot Kipchoge were in tow. But the morning belonged to the soft spoken man from Muscot village in Kerio Valley. He now wants to lower the mark he set in Berlin of two hours, three minutes, and 23 seconds. Kenya, a magnificent moment. The, 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 the race which uh, I ran on Berlin on Sunday. I saw that uh, I was really feeling good and uh, yeah. with that time I can still feel that I still have the potential to even bring it down more. Kipsang said the secret to his success was to maintain an even race and constant press despite the strong winds midstream. We were really running faster but because of the headwind we found that the pace was slowing a little bit and uh, when we found where there was a little wind we f you find that uh, we will try to, 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 to save the seconds. For now, the Tambach High School alumni will bask in the glory of breaking Macau's mark as he plots for other races. Florence Kiplaga, who posted the second Berlin win, said the strong winds made us struggle a bit. Uh, when we reached the 25K, I just felt some blisters and I said I will not make it in, in time. When Sani Lukwachu, Ulengana na Usoebu, Ntoko Muno Kwangu, Lakini. Kipsang, Kipchoge and Florence Kiplagat jet out to their rural homes tomorrow for a series of Thanksgiving parties hosted for their achievements. For Cajun Sports, I'm Hassan Juma. 
Congratulations to the Kenyan Marathon King and Queen. Now remaining with Kipsang's record, and the man who has been there before, Paul Tergat, says Kipsang's new status only serves to confirm Kenya's status as a sporting nation. Tergat, who set the record in 2003, lauded the new man of the moment. It shows, it puts us in the, in the, in the world map that uh, we're actually a sporting nation in terms of uh, as long as, as as far as as long distance is concerned and i think uh, uh, two for two hours and 23 uh, it's, it's 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 a great achievement and i think uh, we have shown the world uh, what we are made of and we are very proud of uh, of, of the performance of uh, kipsang and in football, briefly, remember the UEFA Champions League returns tonight and the current match that is ongoing is between Arsenal and Napoli at the Emirates Stadium. And the latest is that Arsenal are leading 1-0 at the moment, courtesy of a message to Ozil goal. Now in motorsports, drivers taking part in this weekend's Guru Nanak Rally will seek to raise funds for the affected persons in the Westgate attack. 58 drivers are set to take part with series leader Baldev Chaga needing a top 10 finish only in Ivasha to clinch the title. The title chase, however, is not Chaga's to lose since two-time champion Alistair Kavanagh is back again to play a spoiler in a 1976 MK2 Ford Escort. Azar Anor will be without his navigator, Julius Ngegi. Balev Chaga will be going into the penultimate round of the Kenyan National Rally Championship leg, the Guru Nanak Rally, knowing well that it is his to lose as he sits comfortably with 360 points. He will have a new threat this time round since the ever fast challenger as the governor is back and could play a spoiler to Chaga's celebration this year. Governor navigated by championship winning co-driver Gavin Lawrence will however not be challenging for top sport on the event as he will be driving a 1976 MK2 Ford Escort. The rally which will be a day's affair and will be staged in Ivashi and its environs and the organizers are optimistic of what the area has to offer. The, the sections closer to Naivasha are more solid and the section starting in Suswa is a little bit soft in the beginning but it's nothing uh, according, I, I don't believe there's any cause for concern for cars getting stuck. Balev Chaga, who rallied from 17th position to third overall in Kisumu, following an early puncture on CS1, and four out of eight stage wins, only needs a top 10 position to recapture the title he won first in 2008. Veteran Azar Anwar will be having a different feel in Ivasha, as he'll be navigated by his student, Absolu Maswani. His navigator Julius Ngegi is out on a religious duty and the feel of having a new navigator where there's no chemistry won't give him much pressure. It's not that I'm going with one of the top navigators but it, it suddenly became an opportunity for me to help continue promoting the, the sport. My mentor and uh, I don't know, my legend and everything. I have to sit with him. The rally will be flagged off outside Nevasha KCB branch at 7.30 a.m. on October 6th. The event, which is associated with the Sikh community in Kenya, will also be used by drivers to raise funds for those who are affected during the Westgate terror attack. KTN Sports in a